Okay, uh, I just want to observe uh, this same uh, split between uh, saving and investment, this idea that saving disappears into hordes and investment comes out of nowhere. Uh, the same approach is applied to the treatment of taxes and government spending. Uh, how are taxes typically viewed in terms of their effect on overall economic activity? If taxes go up or down, what is supposed to be uh, the effect on overall economic activity? Inverse it's an inverse relation that uh, uh, greater taxes, uh, they're treated essentially in the same way as saving. That uh, It's presumed that the taxes uh, just disappear. They're a leakage too. They're described as a leakage in the contemporary text. And uh, government spending is uh, treated as another exogenous variable, uh, something that's uh, very positive. Now, uh, in reality, uh, taxes and government spending are uh, inseparably connected. When there are more taxes, uh, there will be more government spending. The government is not going to sit on the taxes, you can be sure. Uh, and uh, when uh, there is more government spending, unless the printing press is at work, uh, there will have to be more taxes. So government spending in and of itself is not expansionary uh, to the extent that it would come out of taxes. Uh, there's simply a change in the direction of spending. The taxpayers have less money, they spend less. The government has more, it spends more. Uh, the direction of uh, spending is, is changed, but not the overall amount. Uh, the only thing that uh, creates a connection to the overall amount is uh, if and to the extent that the government finances its spending by the creation of new and additional money. But then the essential thing to be identified is the expansion of the money supply, not government spending. What about deficit spending? Well, even deficit spending. Deficit spending uh, is inflationary only to the extent that the deficit is financed by the creation of money. Uh, if, if the government financed its deficit by borrowing from the public, uh, there wouldn't be any overall expansion. Uh, there'd be less funds available to lend to businesses and in the mortgage market. Uh, the government would have more money. Uh, the private economy would have less. And as a matter of fact, uh, in the long run, uh, if you had deficit financing without the ability to create money, the, it would end up being deflationary. Why would that be the case? Well, uh, what would be the effect of the government having an ever-growing debt? Uh, well, where would that end if they didn't have the ability to create money? The taxpayer would have to pay it. They'd have less money to spend. Prices would end up. Well, if the taxpayer is paying, then the deficit is overcome. Uh, I'm asking, what would be the effect if you have a government that could not create money and was nevertheless, uh, then they would go bankrupt. Then they'd go bankrupt. Now, uh, that happened to Orange County. Uh, uh, it wouldn't have happened if Orange County had had the ability to create money. Then they could just have created money. But they didn't have that ability, and they ended up going into bankruptcy. Now, if, if the federal government ever went into bankruptcy, uh, just think why that would be deflationary. Uh, what, what connection uh, do government bonds have with the assets of the banking system? Aren't government securities a major asset of the banking system? Well, if the government ever went bankrupt, what would be the effect on the asset value of the banks? They would be badly undercut, and then you'd end up having bank runs, and that would produce an actual uh, decrease in the quantity of money. Now, uh, that is not going to happen under our present system, but it doesn't happen only because the government has the ability to create more and more money you and I wouldn't go bankrupt either, uh, even if we maxed out all our credit cards and continued beyond that, if we had the ability that the government has to create money. If when uh, the credit card companies were dunning you, uh, if you could manufacture uh, the payments due, uh, you wouldn't go bankrupt either. Uh, the government doesn't go bankrupt because it has the ability to create money. So long as the money it owes is the money it's able to create. Now, uh, I make a point here, uh, C, 
uh, the idea. We're not seeing it up. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for calling that to my attention. Uh, forgive me. There we go. I have to reduce it to make it fit. Okay, the idea that uh, saving is hoarding, uh, point C, uh, represents the fallacy of composition. Uh, that fallacy is assuming that what is true of the case of an individual can be uh, expanded uh, to the system as a whole. That what's true of a given individual will apply uh, to the system in which the individual participates. Let me make that clear in the following way. Uh, imagine that this class represented a self-contained economic system. Uh, suppose uh, we locked the door for half an hour and we uh, went through uh, some kind of procedure where uh, each of you would produce something and uh, other members of the class would buy it. We'd have uh, some kind of uh, imitation of economic activity. <coughs> now, uh, to the extent that the class as a whole uh, engaged in saving, it would not be possible for the class as a whole to save in the form of adding to its cash holding. Now let's just see why not. As of this moment, each of us has some amount of cash in his pocket or purse or wherever, and it will add up to some definite total. Let's imagine that in the class as a whole, as of this moment, uh, there's a thousand dollars of cash or whatever. Now, whatever buying and selling we engage in among ourselves, some individuals, uh, when we conclude the process, some individuals uh, could have saved in the form of adding to their cash holdings. So suppose we have student A, he starts the, uh, the process with fifty dollars of cash in his pocket, and when we uh, put a stop to the activity, uh, he has uh, $95. And so uh, he has uh, saved $45, which he's added to his cash holding. Uh, so that's, that can certainly happen uh, with a given individual. But what's implied about the cash holdings of the rest of the class all combined? That has to be reduced by 45 because there's no more cash than there was to begin with. So while individuals can uh, save by adding to their cash holdings, their added cash holdings represent <coughs> uh, reductions in cash holdings on the part of others. So there can be no overall aggregate net saving in the form of the addition of cash, with one limited exception, and that would be the extent to which there's an increase in the quantity of money. If somehow we had an arrangement whereby, as we're uh, doing what we're doing, the quantity of money in the class could be increased from $1,000 to 1100 Well, then you could have uh, uh, the $100 added to cash holdings, but that would be the maximum. Uh, apart from that, all saving that occurs beyond the increase in the quantity of money, that has to have a counterpart in the increase in the value of assets other than cash. It has to show up in, in effect, in investment. Yes, Mr. Rosen. I was going to say, what happens if one of the students acts as a bank? to lend money or create, you know, checking deposits. Okay, well then we have the case that we have an increase in the quantity of money, and that addition to the quantity of money, that could be added to cash holdings. But that would be the extent of it. But now, closed. pardon me? But the door is closed. Yeah. No, 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 but the door is closed. <laughs> a literal or figurative door? <laughs> the door is closed, so if a student were to, if a student were to have uh, develop some type of banking system, it really wouldn't matter because no money is coming from outside. Yeah, but in this case, there'd be new and additional money created within the class. So $100. Whatever the amount. Whatever if, we, the amount. if we assume 100 then... Uh, uh, Sa uh, uh, accumulated savings in the form of cash would rise by 100. But uh, to whatever extent the magnitude of aggregate saving exceeds the increase in the quantity of money, the only way it can do so is uh, to the extent there is an increase in the value of assets other than cash. 
So if we were to say, well, uh, in our uh, hypothetical classroom economy, we have 500 of aggregate saving. Uh, if there were no increase in the quantity of money, uh, the only way we could have this 500 of saving would be if there were an increase in the value of assets of 500. Uh, to the extent we have 100 of additional money, uh, then the value of other assets has to go up by 400. The, the, the aggregate saving has to have a counterpart in, uh, in net investment. Aggregate net saving has to have an equivalent in net investment except for the increase in the quantity of money itself. Okay, now uh, let me go further here, and this is point D, that genuine hoarding, uh, understood as an increase in the need and desire to hold cash, uh, uh, such hoarding has nothing to do with saving. It's nothing to do with saving. Uh, what it represents uh, is really an attempt to change the composition of existing savings, uh, to change them from assets other than cash into cash. Uh, when we have, uh, when, when people truly attempt to hoard, to increase their cash holdings, I suppose uh, people start to fear uh, that uh, a credit crunch is coming. A business firm start fearing a credit crunch is coming. And uh, they're overextended. Uh, they borrowed very heavily. Uh, they have debts coming due. Uh, their cash position is weak. Uh, what do they need to do uh, to deal with this problem? Sell. Sell some assets. Uh, sell assets to do what? Raise cash. Uh, to raise cash. They need, they need to <coughs> change the composition of their assets. Let's say here we are, we have a hypothetical company. Uh, its uh, capital is uh, $10 million. And uh, out of this $10 million, they have a very modest amount of cash. Let's say they have 100,000 in cash. That's 1% of their assets. And uh, they have uh, current liabilities looming. Uh, they have various other assets, of course. And uh, if they're afraid uh, of uh, being uh, caught in an uh, illiquid position, uh, they have to now raise cash. Uh, different firms can attempt different uh, procedures. Uh, uh, some might have an inventory clearance. Uh, sell out your inventory uh, and uh, uh, add the receipts or much of the receipts to your cash holding. Uh, if you have accounts receivable coming due, uh, collect them and don't re-extend as many. Uh, or if you have uh, uh, more than one store, maybe you need to sell one of the stores. Or if you have different divisions, uh, maybe you need to liquidate something. Uh, you have to take steps uh, to raise cash. Now, when firms do this, uh, what would be the appropriate uh, description of what they're doing? Would it be A, uh, they're engaged in saving. B, they're engaged in changing the composition of their accumulated savings. B, it's changing the composition of their accumulated savings. Uh, when people, when firms are seeking uh, to acquire cash, that does not represent saving. It represents uh, an attempt to change the makeup of their already accumulated savings. And it's uh, this activity which uh, precipitates uh, a recession. Uh, in the course of the boom, uh, firms get into an illiquid position. Uh, they're uh, investing every last dollar of cash uh, for various reasons, uh, so, uh, which we've actually looked at. Uh, if they've had the uh, expectation that they'll be able to borrow easily and profitably, uh, well, that uh, uh, reduces their perceived need to hold cash. Uh, if they think the demand for their products will be rising, uh, that uh, appears to make it easy uh, to liquidate inventories at a profit. Uh, so these are reasons why firms would uh, tend to uh, become less liquid, uh, have less cash uh, relative to their overall activities. But then what happens if uh, credit uh, ceases to be so easily obtainable? So as they start to worry, uh, they may not be able to uh, refinance uh, some of the loans they have outstanding. And uh, they may not be able uh, to liquidate their inventory at a profit. Uh, then what do they have to do? They have to change the composition of their savings. Not save, uh, they already have savings, they have to reduce the uh, fraction of the savings they have 
that uh, are invested in things like inventory, and they have to increase the fraction that's invested in cash. And uh, when uh, such behavior uh, becomes uh, widespread and substantial, uh, the actual effect is, uh, in the economy as a whole, uh, to reduce the overall amount of saving. Uh, when you have uh, a tendency toward uh, greater cash holdings, uh, well, first of all, what's going to be the effect on sales revenues? What's going to be the effect on spending and sales revenues? Uh, that will fall. And what's the effect of that on, on profits? Fall. Uh, that falls. And as profits fall, uh, what's the effect on, uh, on uh, funds added to retained earnings? That falls. that falls, which means saving is cut, and if firms are incurring losses, or uh, the profits that they're earning are inadequate to cover the dividends that they're paying, what's that do uh, to their already accumulated capitals? It reduces. It reduces. So their accumulated saving is reduced, and uh, to the extent that uh, uh, people lose their jobs in the process, uh, what, is, uh, what is the effect on their accumulated savings? Uh, they'll be uh, drawing the, on them. Uh, their saving will be negative. So uh, hoarding, the, the effect of a, of a greater demand for money for holding, uh, it's uh, so far from being the same as saving that it actually operates uh, to reduce saving or turn it negative. You had a question, Mr. Chung? Yeah, um, so would you consider a firm is, 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 is saving when they, you know, restructure and downsize during the economic slowdown? No, I'm not saying I'm not saying that that's saving at all. I'm saying that that's something very different. That uh, they're <coughs> engaged in uh, changing the composition of their savings. When a firm uh, sells a branch in order to raise cash, that's not an act of saving. Uh, they're attempting to change the way their assets are held. Uh, instead of holding as much of their assets in the form of a physical branch, uh, they want to hold more of their assets in the form of cash. It's not that they're engaged in saving. But your, your cash account will increase, right? So that would consider saving. You no. Uh, let's look at it this way. Yeah, See, yeah. let, let's look at it from the point of view of an individual investor. Suppose we have an individual investor with a net worth of $1 million. And uh, when we look at him, uh, he's invested uh, $975,000 in common stocks and $25,000 in cash. And he becomes alarmed at this. He thinks maybe the market is going to go down. So uh, he sells uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of stocks and uh, decides uh, to hold the proceeds for a time till uh, he knows better. Well, let's assume uh, he can get out at the, at the same prices. So now, instead of having 975 in stocks and 25 in cash, he's got 225 in cash and uh, 775 in stocks. Has he engaged in saving, or has he simply changed the composition of his already existing million dollars of saving? He's changed the composition, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, if this uh, behavior is widespread uh, and people are suddenly deciding they need to increase their liquidity, uh, what do you think will happen to the value of the stocks? Go down. It'll go down. So he might have had <coughs> a million initially, but if uh, large numbers of investors are attempting uh, to increase the fraction of their net worth in cash, uh, the overall total of their net worth is going to go down their accumulated savings will be less. So uh, this is very different than hoarding. Uh, hoarding and saving are so far different that uh, when there is, in fact, the attempt to hoard, the accumulated savings will drop. Yes, Mr. Castillo. If they took the difference, um, if they, they took the difference, uh, uh, their interest rate that they made or, or the, the, the positive cash flow they made on a certain stock, they change that into cash, that wouldn't necessarily be hoarding or changing the composition. That would be truly making money. Uh, you're saying, I uh, suppose they decide to uh, hold more of the uh, dividends coming in in the form of cash? Correct. Well, they might do that, and then uh, you could say, all right, here's an individual, he has an income, and he's deciding to hold his income in the form of cash. Uh, okay, now, uh, he's earning the income, he's not consuming it, 
So we can say, all right, he's saving. That's true. He's saving and he's attempting uh, to add his saving uh, to cash. And so uh, sometimes individuals do that. But uh, what precipitates uh, a recession is not uh, that the individuals are simply holding their income more in cash. Uh, they're attempting to change the composition of their existing assets. And that will have the effect of reducing incomes if they're attempting to uh, increase the fraction in uh, cash holdings. Now, uh, what is also true is that uh, once the process gets going, uh, uh, people uh, can start to be frightened about their jobs, and then there are people who don't have any significant savings, and they're worried uh, now all of a sudden about losing their jobs, and they uh, decide, well, boy, we need to get some savings uh, to be protected. And so uh, they might uh, step up their saving uh, to safeguard against losing their job. And it's possible that uh, if uh, all the conventional forms of investment look bad, uh, maybe they'll attempt to hold their savings in the form of cash because the uh, normal avenues of profitable investment have been taken away. But that's a derivative phenomenon. The thing that launches it is that uh, business firms find that they're insufficiently liquid. Uh, they need to uh, boost their cash holdings relative to their overall assets and current liabilities. Yes, Mr. Rosendahl. Going back to something you said before the break, that the increase in home values that we've seen in this area is due to credit expansion? Yeah, I think the, the nationwide increase, uh, to the extent that it's occurred not just here, but in many other places, uh, credit expansion brought down interest rates very sharply, and this uh, made possible uh, the uh, uh, borrowing much more substantial sums at relatively low monthly payments, and uh, this has served to boost house prices. Now, what will happen uh, if the credit expansion stops and uh, interest rates rise significantly, uh, suppose mortgage rates uh, get back to 7% or something like that. Uh, now, what will that do uh, when there are new people coming around uh, ready to buy a house and they'll have to pay 7% instead of, what is it right now? Uh, five and a half. Okay, uh, that makes a significant difference in your monthly payments. So how many people, how many new buyers will be able to afford the uh, high prices uh, that many of the existing owners have, have paid? Well, that's fewer. I would say much fewer. And so uh, if the existing owners want to sell, in what conditions will they have to sell? In what terms? Lower th th it'll have to be at a sharply lower price. Well, so do you believe this will occur? Well, I can't say uh, to a certainty that it will occur. I'm confident that at some point uh, interest rates will be significantly higher, but whether it will be next month or next year, uh, I, I don't know. Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, I was just going to mention also people that were able to buy houses now because of lower interest rates that bought houses on a adjustable, adjustable or variable loan when these interest rates go up, they budgeted for lower interest rates, but now that the interest rates will rise, that's when houses will probably be offered back onto the market at lower rates because people won't be able to afford what they're in. Right, that's that's a further point that uh, to the I don't know what proportion of mortgages are a variable rate right now. Does anyone know? On the left. Yeah. I mean, the, the fixed rates are so low. The fixed rates are very low. Uh, so, uh, four and a quarter. Uh, four and a quarter, quarter versus five and a half? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I don't know how many people are taking uh, the, the advantage of the four and a quarter. Uh, but the, cha the further challenge in Orange County in particular, yeah. Orange County and Florida, yeah. and Orange County and Florida and Nevada, or Las Vegas, Nevada, mm -hmm. is an instance where the property values are going up so rapidly, but the counter the counter issue is that not only are people um, having adjustable rate mortgages, but they're getting they're getting um, interest only mortgages, mm -hmm. and the challenge is that the sharp rise that will occur not just in the normal step up of an adjustment of a half a half a percent or a percent. But the sharp rise that will that that will 
occur is going to equate to payment shock and a substantial amount of fears, a substantial amount of defaults will occur. Mm -hmm. uh, so even though, even though four and a quarter is the current adjustable rate, the payment options are much lower than the adjustable rate down to where it's at 2%, but there's negative amp, negative amortization. Okay, so if someone is paying four and a quarter and then it goes to seven, uh, that's uh, like a 75% increase yeah. almost. Yeah. yeah. And equity loans also. Yeah. Yes, uh, Mr. Davis. Um, do you attribute any of the current thinking that the generation today has regarding credit and the use of credit to the practices of large banks? For instance, I consider myself back years ago, I think, uh, Citibank sent me my first credit card in the mail at 18, right on my 18th birthday. Uh, I opened yeah. the mail one day and there's a card. I couldn't believe it was real. I actually went to the store, I think the next day, and charged a thousand bucks. I couldn't believe they actually sent me a credit card. Uh, and yeah. sure enough, you know, um, I think that was a start for me to re recognize what credit is and the power of credit and, and the whole thing. They, they didn't waste a day on having a credit card in my hand. Well, I see the ability to do that uh, rests on their ability to create new and additional money. Right. If they couldn't create new and additional money, uh, the only funds available would have to be provided by savings. And you're speaking of the aggregate, though, because the Citibank Corporation does not have the ability to create new additional money. The, the bank does, yeah. Uh, all on their fractional reserve banking, uh, all of the banks, to the extent they have any excess reserves, uh, they can create new and additional deposits. And uh, credit cards are lines of credit, and the ability uh, to have a widespread extension of lines of credit, I think, depends on the ability to create new and additional money, a sudden widespread increase in lines of credit. And they, they wouldn't be in a position to do that uh, if they didn't have this ability. What was the percentage rate on that thing? I can't tell you. I want to say it was more like 13 or 15 like that. Uh -huh. Okay, well, let me just say uh, further that uh, what sets things up uh, where firms will suddenly need uh, to become more liquid <coughs> is that before that, uh, they've been led to become unduly illiquid. Uh, first, in the boom phase, in the boom phase, uh, firms become unduly illiquid. They think that uh, they'll be able to borrow easily and profitably. Everything they're doing is profitable. Uh, so they run their cash holdings down. Uh, they think they'll be able to liquidate their inventories easily and profitably. And when uh, the music stops, or they start to fear that it's about to stop, uh, then they have to rebuild their cash holdings. Yeah. Now, uh, you, we would not have the need, we wouldn't get into this situation where firms suddenly need to become more liquid if they first had not become unduly illiquid. It's the uh, process of becoming unduly illiquid in the preceding boom that is laying the groundwork of the later contraction. Can you uh, Pardon me? On that one? Yeah. Uh, it's so long as firms think they can borrow easily and profitably, uh, on the foundation of credit expansion, uh, the banking system is creating new and additional money that it's making available for loans. Okay. That holds interest rates down relative to the rate of profit. That makes it uh, appear worthwhile to borrow. Uh, debt burdens rise uh, relative to assets. Right. It's, it seems profitable. It's better to be leveraged. And uh, it appears that you can uh, liquidate your inventories uh, more easily. Uh, so put more money into inventory rather than uh, holding cash. It's this boom phase uh, that is leading to uh, the rundown in cash holdings, where firms are operating with less cash relative to their overall level of activity. Uh, the overall level of activity is uh, jumped up uh, by this phenomenon. But then, uh, when the process comes to an end, uh, people find they have inadequate cash balances. They now need to restore them. Uh, if uh, they weren't led into being illiquid in the first place, if we didn't have the boom, we would not have the basis for the bust. The boom is the basis of the bust. That's what I'm saying. All right, let's turn now uh, to this proposition that what is saved is spent and actually accounts for most spending in the economic system. Uh, saving is what accounts 
for most spending in the economic system. And let's start with one uh, uh, important, but by no means the most important example, expensive consumers' goods, of which the leading example is houses. Uh, how many people are in a position to buy a house out of current income? Yes? Without a loan? Without a loan? Yeah. Without a loan. Without a loan. Cash. Out of current income. Not, not just out of cash, but out of current income. So if you look at your annual income, uh, let's say you're making $100,000 a year, how many people can afford to buy a three, four, or five hundred thousand dollar house out of their annual income. They wouldn't be in this class if they had that kind of flow. <laughs> virtually nobody. Maybe. Virtually nobody. Uh, maybe Gates is happy with, uh, uh, I don't know, a five hundred million dollar mansion. I don't know what he spent for it, and he might have an annual income that's substantially greater than that. But uh, leaving aside uh, a bare handful of such exceptions, uh, virtually nobody can afford to buy such a thing as a house out of uh, a, a current year's income? Uh, how many people can afford to buy a new car out of their current income? You'll find more, more possibilities there. But even so, uh, imagine uh, that uh, you're earning $100,000 a year. Uh, I think you'd probably be pressed a little bit uh, to buy a $25,000 car uh, out of that year's income, because you need uh, your income for many other things. Now, uh, most people are paid uh, monthly or every two weeks, and in many cases, every week. Uh, how many people can buy uh, even a toaster oven uh, out of one week's income? Well, there are a lot of people perhaps who can do that, but can everybody? Pardon me? Small, relatively small. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it. What are, toast, what are toaster ovens going for today? Forty bucks. Forty bucks. Okay. Now, uh, I suppose. I uh, suppose someone. Uh, obviously, if you're making a, a good salary, uh, you won't notice just forty dollars. So uh, you could do it. But uh, there are many people who can't do this. And now, even if you're making a good salary, uh, let's say you're paid once a month. Uh, can you afford a new refrigerator out of the income of that one month? Uh, it, would be, it would be a question. Let's say, uh, what does a new refrigerator cost? How much? Fifteen hundred. A good size refrigerator might cost uh, close to two thousand dollars. Okay. Now let's suppose uh, that your uh, monthly income uh, is ten thousand uh, dollars. Uh, if you're paying taxes out of that, uh, it's going to be an awful lot less. So suppose uh, you're ending up with 6000 Well, if your uh, disposable funds are 6000 I don't think you can just uh, toss off a $2,000 expenditure. I mean, maybe you might, but uh, for most people, uh, you'd be pressing things. So uh, you could buy a refrigerator uh, out of one period's income. Uh, you might accumulate the price of a refrigerator, but in order to do so, what would you have to be doing? Save. You'd have to save. And to buy a home, uh, there has to be a tremendous saving. Uh, even if you'd get a loan, uh, you will still most likely need a down payment. I think the uh, standard down payment is 20%. So suppose here you are, you had $100,000 a year income, and uh, you're being reasonably prudent, uh, you'll only spend $300,000 for a home. Many people are doing a lot more than that, of course. But let's say uh, you wanted to get a $300,000 house. Well, uh, the 20% down payment is $60,000. How many people, even if they're earning $100,000 a year, uh, can uh, uh, get that down payment together out of one year's income, let alone one month's income? So what must they do uh, to, uh, to get the, the down payment here? They have to save. And in order to borrow, uh, where does the part of, of the proceeds that you borrow, where does that come from? That's other people's savings. So what is the demand for houses, uh, automobiles, uh, any expensive consumer's good, any consumer's good that uh, represents uh, more than a minor fraction 
of one pay period's income. It has to come from savings. The demand for all expensive consumers' goods depends on savings. Now suppose people weren't saving. Well, how would anyone buy a house? Uh, they couldn't do it. If, if we didn't have saving, you couldn't have uh, a demand for houses, you couldn't have a demand for automobiles. Uh, the demand for expensive consumers' goods uh, rests on a foundation of saving. Now this idea that when people are saving, this is bad for the economy, well, it's certainly not bad uh, for the demand for expensive consumers' goods. That it depends on saving. Now let's go even further, and uh, we'll see how the role of saving is uh, even much more important than this. Uh, consider all of the spending for capital goods, uh, starting with all of the spending for goods at the wholesale level and then all of the spending uh, for machinery, uh, equipment, materials, uh, components, supplies, uh, all the wage payments made by business firms. Are these uh, payments made by the consumers when they buy the consumer's goods? No, they're made by the business firms. And what kind of expenditure do they represent? Productive. They're productive expenditures. These are expenditures made for the purpose of making subsequent sales at a profit. And uh, this uh, productive expenditure, uh, this depends on, on saving. I, I jump ahead here. A productive expenditure depends on saving, uh, yeah. on the portion of their revenues and incomes that people do not consume. Now just think, uh, uh, the extent to which business firms have funds available uh, to buy goods at wholesale. Uh, to meet their payrolls, uh, to buy materials, components, supplies, equipment, the rest of it. Uh, how is that affected uh, by the extent to which they pay dividends? How is it affected by, by, but, by, by the extent dividend? to which a firm would pay a dividend? Let's say here you are, uh, you have certain uh, financial resources available to you, uh, you have your sales revenues coming in, uh, but uh, you could, uh, and firms do, uh, use some part of their sales revenues to pay dividends. In the case of uh, partnerships and sole proprietorships, uh, the partner or proprietor uh, draws funds from the firm. Uh, every week he takes out a certain amount at his discretion. Uh, what, what is the effect of uh, dividends and draw payments uh, being increased or decreased on the funds available uh, to make these productive expenditures? Uh, what are you saying? Dividends will be decreased. Well, I'm saying what is the effect of uh, paying greater dividends or making greater uh, draw payments? What is the effect of that on the ability to make these productive expenditures? It would decrease. It'll decrease it, right? If you're paying greater dividends, what does that do to the funds you have available for well, the activities? It's less. It's less. Uh, so <coughs> if you... Uh, and the, the purpose of the dividends, presumably, is uh, consumption. Uh, if, uh, in other words, the consumption that takes place uh, out of the sales revenues, that is inversely related to the extent that the sales revenues can be used for productive expenditures. The sales revenues can be used to make either consumption expenditures via mm -hmm. dividends and draw, or productive expenditures, uh, to the extent that are used for productive expenditures, the firms receiving the sales revenues have to abstain from consuming them. They have to save the sales revenues. The productive expenditure depends on saving, the abstention from consumption. Yes. So the demand for goods at wholesale, the demand for materials, equipment, supplies, etc., that depends on saving. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, the great bulk of spending in the economic system is productive expenditure, not consumption expenditure. And I think we can uh, illustrate this point by starting with the uh, sales revenues of supermarkets. Uh, what is a typical profit margin in a supermarket? Mm -hmm. 
I'm hearing uh, bids ranging from 15 down to two. Whoa, low. I think it's actually on the order of two percent. That's the the profit margin, the profit margin, the net profit. Now, this doesn't mean this does not mean that uh, a supermarket could not have a 15 percent rate of profit, but the rate of profit is calculated on the capital invested, not the sales revenue. The profit margin is profit as a percentage of sales. Now, if you had a supermarket that earns 2% uh, on sales, and if its sales were 7.5 times its capital, then 2% on something that's 7.5 times, that would be 15% on the capital. But on the sales, it's only 2% in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Well, now, if, uh, if the profit margins of the supermarkets are on the order of uh, 2%, what does that imply about their costs as a percentage of sales? It would be 98%. The, the sales revenues are equal cost plus profit. So if the profit is 2%, the costs are 98%. Now, what do the costs uh, reflect? Where, where do the costs come from? Uh, when labor, capital goods. Uh, uh, there's labor, capital goods, uh, a lot of things uh, reflected, but what in connection with labor ca and capital goods? Expenditures. Yes? Cost the money they put out to, to get them. Uh, expenditures. Yeah, the prior productive expenditures. You see, think about it. Uh, when a business has costs, the costs that a business deducts from its sales revenues derive from its prior expenditures. It's the expenditures that give rise to the cost. Now, now how do you know uh, what the labor cost is of producing a given product? So you just pull that number out of a hat? Or doesn't it come from the payment of the wages to the workers? That's what uh, shows up as the labor cost. Uh, and where does your materials cost come from? It's the purchases of the materials and the depreciation cost. That's a fraction of the purchase of the plant and equipment. So uh, all of the costs reflect prior productive expenditures. They all reflect productive expenditures. And if uh, costs are 98% of sales, yeah. uh, what can we infer, at least approximately, as to the relationship between the sales and the productive expenditures that are made to earn those sales? That expenditure was high that they should be on the order of 98% too. But you have productive expenditures uh, on the order of 98% of the sales, and that's uh, giving you costs of 98% of sales. In fact, uh, the productive expenditures uh, can be a greater percentage. Uh, let's say, uh, imagine you have a firm, or even the supermarkets. Suppose uh, the supermarkets uh, are earning 2% on sales, uh, but this 2% uh, on sales is translating in to uh, 10 or 15% on capital invested. Mm. Uh, what would the supermarkets be doing with some significant part of the profit that they're making? They'd be saving and reinvesting. So if the supermarkets were saving and reinvesting half of the net profit, uh, what would that imply about uh, the fraction of the sales revenues that was going into productive expenditure? I think it would imply that it's 99% instead of 98%. Because 2% is equal to the profit, and half of the profit is being saved and productively expended. So uh, uh, the uh, productive expenditure in this case certainly is huge. And uh, even if we uh, take other cases, uh, there are other industries uh, where the profit margin is higher, maybe 10%. Uh, there are some where it's 20%. But even so, uh, even if you have uh, an industry with a relatively high profit margin, like 20%, well, what does the eight, what does the 80% represent? Productive expenditure. Uh, productive expenditure, and if they're saving half their profit, then uh, their productive expenditure could well be 90% of their sales. Now, if we look further, uh, suppose we elaborate the uh, supermarket example. Uh, out of the uh, 98 or 99, let, let's focus on the cost. 98% uh, uh, is cost. Uh, some substantial part of those costs uh, represents further sales revenues to, to other businesses, uh, sales revenues to their suppliers. 
uh, supermarkets are uh, buying things to some extent from wholesalers. Uh, they're uh, paying lighting and heating bills, uh, advertising outlays. Uh, they purchased fixtures and equipment. Uh, all of these purchases are sales revenues to other firms. And these other firms, uh, they have a profit margin too, and they have costs as a percentage of their sales. Well, suppose, uh, for the sake of illustration, imagine that uh, in the case of the supermarkets, of the 98 cents on each dollar of sales that's cost, uh, assume 38 cents was uh, labor cost and 60 cents was cost on account of purchases um, from other firms in one form or another. Uh, goods at wholesale, lighting, heating, advertising, uh, purchases of uh, fixtures and, and uh, structures, whatever. I now, how much more productive expenditure is there standing behind that 60 cents on the dollar that the supermarkets pay in buying capital goods? Suppose the suppliers to the supermarkets, uh, suppose their profit margin is 10%, 10% of the 60 cents that they're getting from the supermarkets. <coughs> then what would be their costs? 54. 54 cents, okay. Well, now, even if we stopped here, how much productive expenditure have we uh, counted up uh, compared uh, to the initial dollar of consumption expenditure? <laughs> yes? A dollar fifty-two. We have ninety-eight cents at least at the supermarket level, and then another fifty-four cents at the level of the suppliers to the supermarkets. And we could carry this to further stages, and it shouldn't be too surprising if we ended up with two dollars of productive expenditure for every one dollar of consumption. Sure. And I think uh, in the economy as a whole, uh, productive expenditure uh, is uh, probably at least as great as consumption expenditure, uh, if not substantially greater. Hmm. And uh, the far greater part of that is uh, simply ignored. Okay, I'm going to uh, skip ahead a bit here and jump to uh, point four, uh, which is that uh, saving uh, increases real demand uh, by increasing production. And here we'll try to uh, make a link back to our discussion uh, before the midterm of Say's Law. Uh, Say's Law establishes that a real demand depends on production and supply. It's more production and supply that uh, determine real demand. Well, one of the things that I'll be out to show, I suppose, next week is that uh, the greater the degree of saving, uh, the more rapidly can production and supply increase. Uh, the greater the, an economy's concentration on the production of capital goods, uh, the greater will be its ability to produce. And if you want a quick uh, shorthand uh, confirmation, uh, just think of Japan, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, and apparently uh, China too. Uh, they're concentrating on the uh, production of capital goods and what's happening uh, to their overall ability to produce each year. It's growing. It's rapidly growing. Now, what does that imply about real demand? It's increasing. That it's increasing correspondingly. So uh, the greater the degree of saving, uh, the higher and more rapidly growing will be uh, aggregate real demand. Now, uh, further, uh, point five, uh, if we had a commodity money, if we had a commodity money, like gold or silver, uh, and, uh, and it's true that uh, more saving uh, serves to increase the ability to produce, uh, so if we have more saving, uh, we should be able to produce uh, more automobiles, uh, more television sets, whatever. Uh, 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 if we have more and better mining equipment uh, that saving makes possible, uh, what does that imply about our ability to produce minerals? We should produce more minerals. And uh, what does it imply about our ability uh, to, to produce metals? And then still more specifically, the precious metals that constitute the money supply. The big positive correlation. That we should be able to produce more of all of those things. So uh, what should be happening uh, to the quantity of money as a byproduct 
of the increase in the ability to produce under a precious metal monetary system. Okay. The quantity of money should grow, and what will that imply about the actual uh, overall uh, amount of spending in terms of money? More money to spend. That there'll be more money. So even though uh, people <coughs> are saving more heavily, uh, the byproduct of this is a greater production of the monetary unit, which means, uh, on the, according to the quantity theory of money, a greater volume of spending. And ultimately, what would be the effect on the amount of spending even for consumers' goods? Increase. Pardon me? Would increase. It would increase. Uh, the spending for consumers' goods would be a smaller fraction, but it would be a smaller fraction of a larger total. Mm -hmm. uh, the way you can think of it is, uh, the more the economy saves, uh, you can think of it in terms of a pie chart, uh, the smaller the fraction of the pie that's uh, consumption, and the bigger the fraction that is saving, uh, the bigger and more rapidly growing does the whole pie tend to be. And as it gets to be big enough, the absolute size of the consumption slice, when it's a smaller fraction, uh, it'll be a larger absolute amount. And I think a very good, yes, uh, Mr. Taylor? Well, I was going to ask, could you, could you clarify how, um, how the uh, increase of commodity money uh, is realized because of savings? I, I, I'm not getting it. Okay. Uh, well, if we have greater saving, that will mean we have a greater concentration on the production of capital goods of all kinds. Right. Okay. And if there are more savings available, uh, what will that do to the kinds of equipment available uh, for things like gold mining? Well, then I guess that would go on. It would be improved. Right. Okay. And also, uh, when you have uh, a bigger supply of capital goods, uh, the greater the supply of capital goods, uh, the, the wider the range of technologies that can be adopted. And, uh, and as we have the, the adoption of better technologies, uh, that further contributes to the okay. supply of capital goods. Okay. So uh, we would expect that, that we have a general increase in production. One of the things whose production increases under a commodity money system should be the monetary unit also. So uh, understood this way, uh, more saving will underlie not only more real demand, but also more monetary demand. And a very good illustration of this, even without a gold standard, uh, is Japan. Now I assume you all know that uh, from the 1950s, uh, at least up to 1990, uh, Japan uh, was one of the most heavily saving economies in the world. And uh, each year this built up their ability to produce. Uh, each year, uh, out of whatever they could produce, uh, they concentrated heavily on capital goods, which meant the next year they could produce more, and then uh, they could produce more capital goods as well. And you do this for 40 years or so, and you have uh, an incredible improvement. Well, how did Japan's tremendous growth as a producer, how did that affect the ability of the Japanese to consume? Increased. They became uh, the world's second largest consuming nation after us. Uh, they were the world's second largest producing nation on the foundation of saving and capital accumulation, and this uh, made it possible for them to consume vastly more than they had ever consumed before. Now imagine that the Japanese had not done what they did. Uh, suppose uh, they adopted the attitude they need to consume every last the yen that they earn. Uh, what would have been the effect on the ability to develop the Japanese economy? Japan would be pretty much back where it was 50 years ago. And how would that have affected the ability of the Japanese to consume? Couldn't consume as much. They couldn't they be consuming at the level of 50 years ago. Now, uh, they would have consumed a higher percentage than they did at the time. Uh, let's say uh, in 1950, uh, I don't know what precise percentage they consumed in that particular year, but uh, out of their uh, net income, uh, let's say uh, they consumed 70 percent, uh, they saved 30 percent out of their net income. Well, had they not saved at all, uh, they could have had some significant rise in consumption in 1950. Uh, they'd have been uh, consuming 40% uh, more than they did. But uh, today, uh, their whole economy has increased by a huge multiple 
Uh, maybe it's 10 times or more the size of what it was in 1950. And so if they consume 70% of something that's 10 times bigger, that's vastly more than 100% of where they were to begin with. So uh, their ability to consume has uh, depended on uh, the high degree of their saving. And this uh, is all under the heading of point six. Uh, saving increases consumption in the long run by bringing about an increase in the production and supply of goods. Okay, now we're in a position to turn to aggregate economic accounting, and I uh, describe it as uh, aggregate economic accounting on an Aristotelian base, uh, meaning uh, a base recognizing that the demand for A is just the demand for A, that we don't buy any more than we're buying, and we have to take into account uh, the separate, distinct purchases of capital goods and the payment of wages. And I want to uh, develop uh, aggregate economic account accounting uh, in the light of this approach. And where we will start is with the conventional accounting aggregates. Uh, the uh, easiest uh, aggregate, uh, the easiest accounting aggregate is a national income, which is symbolized uh, by the letter Y. This is the general convention, it's not my invention. And national income is the sum of uh, four distinct components. Uh, there's profits, uh, uh, both corporate and uh, 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 individual and uh, partnership, that's profits. And there's uh, wages, wages and salaries. Uh, there's uh, uh, net interest income. And then uh, there's the further item, net rental income of persons. Now this goes back uh, to the terminology of the early classical economists. Uh, they distinguished uh, three basic categories of income, profits, wages, and rent. Uh, and uh, they regarded interest as a kind of subcategory of profit, uh, which we will do also. Uh, but uh, the way the national accounts are drawn up, uh, there are these uh, four basic components. And uh, taking them all together, uh, they equal national income. National income is simply the sum of all of the profit, interest, wage, and rental incomes uh, of everybody uh, in the economy. Uh, our uh, gross, our uh, uh, domestic income, I guess today you'd call it domestic income, uh, is the totality of the incomes of everybody uh, living in the United States, everyone living and earning any kind of income in the United States. That would be uh, what I'm calling national income. Now, uh, a, a major uh, aggregate accounting relationship is that national income is equal to net national product, NNP, or we could substitute net domestic product, NDP. There's only a very trivial distant difference uh, between national and domestic. Uh, I may as well uh, tell you the difference. Uh, the domestic product refers to uh, what is produced or the incomes earned uh, within the territory of the United States. Whether it's earned by American nationals or by foreign nationals who are earning it here. Uh, a national product, in contrast, would exclude the earnings of foreign nationals within our borders and include the earnings of American nationals abroad. So the national product applies to the earnings of all nationals living here or abroad the domestic product applies to earnings here, whether by nationals or by foreigners residing here. It doesn't amount to much difference. Hmm. Pardon me? Some don't differ that much. No, I would say it's an insignificant difference. Uh, we, could, uh, we could disregard it. All right, but in any case, uh, a central aggregate accounting relationship is that uh, national income uh, equals net national product, NNP which in turn is equal to consumption plus net investment. And will include as a subcategory of consumption, government spending. There we go, right here. So uh, this is a central relationship. Uh, national income equals net national product or net domestic product, however you want to uh, categorize it. We'd have to say, I suppose, uh, 
domestic income equals net domestic product. But uh, I'm more used to saying uh, national income equals uh, net national product, which in turn equals consumption plus net investment. Now, there's a very simple relationship between that and uh, gross product. And let us take a look at that right away. Can you guys see this in the back? You can't? Would you like, to, there's an empty seat up here if you want to move forward. Let's see if I can enlarge it once more. Okay, now here we are. We have the same relationship. Profit, wages, interest, and rent equals national income. Y equals net national product, which is the return consumption plus net investment. Now, it's only a simple step to go uh, from the uh, NNP to GNP or GDP. All you have to do is add depreciation allowances to NNP that becomes GD GDP or GNP. Add uh, the same depreciation allowances to net investment and we get gross investment. Oh. It can't be that thrilling. <laughs> so, uh, net investment, let me uh, say a little more about what net investment is. Net investment is uh, the sum of net investment in plant and equipment and net investment in inventory. There are two components to net investment, net investment in plant and net investment in inventory. If we add depreciation allowances to uh, net investment in plant, it becomes gross investment. Uh, let me elaborate on this a little more. Uh, uh, the way uh, net investment in plant would be arrived at is it's the difference between two things. It's the difference between uh, the additions being made to plant and equipment by virtue of expenditures being made to buy them and subtractions being made by virtue of depreciation. So let's imagine uh, we have a firm, uh, let's make it very simple, suppose you have a brand new firm and it goes out and spends a million dollars uh, buying uh, various pieces of equipment. Okay, what's the value of the equipment on its books? What it spent, one million dollars, okay? So uh, it opens its books with, it has a uh, million dollars worth of equipment that it's purchased. Now, uh, let's suppose we go into the following year and this equipment, let's say, has a life of three years, and a depreciable life of three years. Uh, in fact, let's suppose they bought it all uh, in the first quarter of the year and so uh, they'll have a year's depreciation uh, in that first year over a three-year life. Okay, uh, they spent a million uh, for their assets. Uh, where would that enter in their balance sheet? Under what heading would that go? Well, it would be the gross plan, right? The gross plan and equipment. Uh, uh, pardon me? Plan and equipment. Okay, that would be the gross plan and equipment again. And now, let's assume uh, they're depreciating it over a three-year period. So what's the depreciation in this year? I mean, 333, okay. Uh, what would be their net plant and equipment? 667, six, 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 uh, the million minus the one third of a million. Uh, that's their net plan, okay. Now, uh, suppose in the next year, in year two, uh, they buy a fresh one million of plant, a similar plant, and they'll do that in the first quarter, we'll imagine. And they incur uh, one third of it as depreciation. How much are they adding to their gross plan in the second year? Six. One million. They're adding one million to the gross plan. That's what they're buying. And what's depreciation in year two? Six, six, six. That year? In year two. Right. Six, 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 six. It's six, six, six. Because uh, they have the depreciation on the new assets for a year and the depreciation, year two's depreciation on uh, the assets they bought the year before. Okay, what's the effect on the uh, on their net plan? How much has their net plan increased uh, in, at the end of year two compared to year one? Twelve point three. Yeah, six 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 twice. Yeah. Okay, you say they have one point three. Well, uh, they have uh, two million of gross assets, right? 
Right. Okay, and they have, uh, what's the accumulated depreciation on the first year? Three. Well, three, three, three on the first. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, six, six, six on the first. Six, six, six on the first, and three, three, three on the second. So what is their net plant? It's one million, uh, two million minus one million. The net plant is one million. And uh, how much has their net plant increased uh, this year compared with last year? It, it was 667, right? Uh, now it's a million. It was a million minus 333. Now it's 2 million minus 1 million, right? Okay. Uh, so there's an increase in net plant of 333. Pardon me? 1.333. No, it's 333. 2 million minus 1 million. Okay, now notice uh, what's produced this 333 increase in net plant is the fact they've spent a million for new plant and equipment this year, but what is this year's depreciation? The depreciation that uh, the firm will incur oh, this year? Six. Yes? Triple six. It's triple six, 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 six. They have 333 <coughs> on the assets they bought this year and 333 from the assets last year. Well, notice uh, the net change in their plant is the difference between their current expenditures on account of plant and equipment, the million, less their current year's depreciation. Now, how does this work? Well, the expenditures they're making in the current year for plant and equipment, that's in addition to gross plant. That's it, what's added to the gross plant account. Uh, if, if there were no uh, current depreciation, the addition to gross plant would flow through as an equal addition to net plant. But uh, we have a deduction from the gross plant. We have the depreciation. So uh, to the extent there's depreciation, net plant is diminished. Purchases of gross plant add to the net plant, but depreciation subtracts from the net plant. Uh, new plant and equipment spending is an addition to net plant, but depreciation is a subtraction from net plant. Well, what is the difference between the sum of additions and the sum of subtractions? <coughs> Net it's the net change, the net investment. The, the net investment is the difference between the sum we're adding to gross plan and implicitly net plan and the sum we're subtracting from net plan, which is the depreciation. The expenditures for new plant and equipment are additions to gross plan and to net plan. The depreciation is a subtraction from net plan. So that's why it's net investment in plant. Now, if we don't subtract the depreciation, if we just look at the uh, expenditures uh, for new plant and equipment, well, that's the gross investment in plant. That's the gross investment. The net investment is that minus the depreciation. Yes? Well, as a mere mortal, I'm trying to understand this. Yeah. And you seem to understand it, yeah. When you talk about the depreciation, you generally talk about on an annual basis for that one year, or you talk about an aggregate for the all the years up to that particular point? Oh, yeah. <coughs> When we talk about net investment, it's the uh, current expenditure uh, for new plant and equipment minus that year's depreciation, the current depreciation. Current year depreciation. Yeah, right. So if you've got uh, prior depreciation from three years prior, we, we don't, do not include that in that calculation. That would not be included in a calculation of net or, or gross investment in the current year. Okay. That would be purely a balance sheet item. Uh, but when we take it into account, we see, th that enables us to see, I think, how it is that uh, current expenditure of a plant minus current depreciation, how that shows up as the net change in net plant. Okay, so uh, GDP is uh, essentially just uh, consumption, private and government, uh, and net investment. I'm sorry, uh, gross investment, GDP is consumption, private and government, and gross investment. And NDP, or NNP, is a GDP minus depreciation. Yes, uh, Mr. So does it fair to say that uh, net is before depreciation and gross is after depreciation? No, it's the opposite. Net yeah. is after okay. depreciation. Net, net is, is after. after, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, that's right. When you said plus depreciation, does that generally mean subtracting depreciation? So you say no. a $1,000 investment plus $500 in depreciation, does that mean uh, that's $500 net value investment? No. Uh, whether we're adding or subtracting depends on the starting point. If our starting point is 
uh, gross, then we subtract depreciation to get to net. Right. If we start with net, then we add depreciation to get to gross. Okay. Yes, Mr. White. Oh. Is it, is it true that generally speaking, now, I, okay, I know that what you're talking about is that you say, oh, this piece of equipment that you buy has a life of three years. Yeah. Um, now, does the government decide how long you can yes. depreciate it? Yeah, exactly. Well, they have something to say in terms of what they'll allow for tax purposes, so they have depreciation schedules, but uh, you're not bound in your own accounting to go by their schedules. Uh, you could decide that uh, obsolescence is extremely rapid, and you might, in your own accounting, uh, depreciate more rapidly uh, than is allowed for tax purposes. Oh, I see. Now, I don't know if you'd be able, if your auditors or accountants would let you uh, have a uh, published balance sheet or income statement in which you were depreciating less rapidly. They might have a problem with well, that. Well, there are some nationally accepted accounting practices. Yeah, they're That's bound the by the generally accepted values. accounting practices. Okay, so uh, hopefully I've established uh, what uh, the aggregates are. The, the, the basic way to understand it, you all know what profit is. You know what a wage or a salary is. And uh, the national income is the totality of all of that for everybody within the country for a year. And then GDP is essentially that plus uh, the total of business depreciation allowances. Now, uh, as I've shown, uh, uh, Keynesian economics obliterates uh, the role of saving and productive expenditure. And in its view, uh, almost all expenditure is consumption expenditure. Uh, the only other kind of expenditure it recognizes is uh, net investment or, or sometimes gross investment. But the gross investment, bear in mind, gross investment is net investment with respect to inventories. I said uh, there's two components of net investment. There's net investment in plant and there's net investment in inventory. Uh, gross investment is gross merely with respect to plant, not with respect to inventory. Not now, in pardon me? Not with respect to Not with respect to inventory. It's gross only with respect to plan. With respect to inventory, it's still net investment. Now, uh, consumption spending, uh, <coughs> private and government together, is vastly larger uh, than net investment. It's even vastly larger than gross investment. I think uh, between the two of them, uh, they're on the order of 85% of GDP, maybe even 90%. And because of this uh, quantitative preponderance of consumption uh, over anything else, it's usually assumed that consumption expenditure pays the great bulk of national income. See, we have this equation, uh, profits, wages, interest, rent on the one side. Uh, that is equal to consumption plus investment on the other. And it's thought that consumption and investment pay uh, the national income that profits, wages, interest, and rent are paid by consumption plus investment. Well, consumption is vastly greater uh, than investment, and so it's thought that the great bulk of incomes are paid by consumption. And uh, this view of things uh, is present uh, implicitly or explicitly uh, in every uh, depiction of national income as uh, being determined by the sum of consumption plus investment. Hmm. And there is a, a popular diagram called the Keynesian cross, which you'll find uh, in every uh, uh, contemporary textbook. And let us take a look at that. Uh, this uh, thing, uh, figure 15-2, is a, a Keynesian cross. And what we've got here is on the uh, vertical axis, we have national income, consumption, and investment. And on the horizontal axis, we have uh, simply national income. And here we have a 45 degree line. Uh, every point on this line uh, will uh, represent equal distance on both axes. And so this point here uh, is the same on this axis as on this axis, and every other point on this line. Now, uh, here's consumption. And uh, if we only had consumption, uh, the argument would be, uh, if this is the magnitude of consumption, uh, 
this much consumption will generate this much income. Mm. This much consumption spending generates uh, this much income. And if out of that level of income, uh, people consume the same, uh, if they would consume 100% of their incomes, uh, then uh, what would be the new income produced? It would be equal, it would be the same. And that's why this would be labeled an equilibrium point, E. This would be a kind of equilibrium. Uh, if this is income, and if out of this income, uh, an equal amount of consumption occurs, that will regenerate the same level of income. Okay, so here's consumption uh, supposedly generating uh, all of this income. Uh, now let's add in investment. We'll have, we'll assume uh, some fixed amount of investment. Uh, here's the magnitude of investment. Uh, it's the difference between this uh, CC line and the C plus I, C plus I line. This vertical distance is the amount of uh, net investment. Okay, now how much income uh, will the sum of consumption plus net investment generate? Uh, let's say we started, uh, we're over here, uh, we have, uh, uh, let's say we have consumption uh, generating this much income. How much more will be generated when we add in investment? If this is consumption and it's generating income equal to this, and this is consumption, the same amount of consumption plus a given amount of investment, how much income does it generate? More. More. Instead of generating uh, from here over <coughs> here, it generates from here out to here. Now, here we are. Uh, if, this, uh, if this were the level of income, uh, let, let's say we're up here. Consumption plus investment are generating this much income at a certain point. Notice this is marked E prime. This indicates another higher equilibrium. How much consumption takes place out of an income uh, equal to E prime? Less. Less e minus. E minus th this much. This much here. And if we add to this much consumption, uh, this much investment, how much is the total income generated? Hmm. That's fascinating. It can't be that fast. <laughs> I don't know why I feel like I'm being heckled. Oh, it's me. Come to the microphone. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> 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 for a specific amount, a percentage, I mean, what are you looking for? Okay. Maybe for a more or less? Pardon me? Maybe for a percentage, are you looking uh, for a I, difference? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm short-circuiting this a little bit. Uh, this line, CC, uh, who here has taken a previous uh, macroeconomics course? Uh, uh, what, what would this represent? It, it has two, two, two parts to the name. Uh, the second part is function. Uh, you have the first letter of the first name. What, yes? Consumption. The consumption function, the consumption function. This is a major doctrine in Keynesian economics. Uh, they say that, they claim that uh, consumption expenditure is a mathematical function of income. And they have a, an actual equation, an equation of the form uh, A plus uh, CY. A is some constant, uh, like $100 billion, and C is some uh, fraction of the income, like 0.8 of income. So a possible consumption function would be $100 billion plus 80% of national income. And uh, uh, diagrammatically, if that, that would mean uh, here's $100 billion, uh, right. This much consumption occurs if there's zero income. But then as uh, income rises, if income gets above zero, uh, well now we have to add to the 100 billion 80% of whatever the income is. Well, here we are, we have 100 billion plus 80% of the income, uh, that reproduces the income. Is that national income that you're talking about? Yeah, this would be national income. Uh, imagine if national income were 500 billion and consumption is 100 billion plus 0.8 of national income, how much would consumption be? 1.4 billion. Uh, what's 100 plus 0.8 of 500? 100 plus 0.8 of 500 is 400. So it would be 500. Uh, if, this, if this consumption function were 100 billion plus 0.8, well, and if this is 500 billion of income, We'll have 500 billion of consumption, and that will regenerate the same income. 
But now, uh, suppose we have uh, some given amount of investment, like 20 billion of investment. Right. Okay, now, uh, then uh, the equilibrium income is gonna be uh, substantially higher. Uh, the equilibrium income is going to be, uh, I would think, uh, 600 billion, according to the Keynesians. If we have uh, 600 billion income, uh, how much consumption will 600 billion generate? if consumption is equal to 100 plus 0.8 of the income. What's 100 plus 0.8 of 600? 580, I think. 100 plus 60%, uh, 80% of 600, that's 480 plus 100, that's 580. Okay, uh, here we are, this would represent 580 of consumption. Now, if this were the only factor at work, uh, all it would produce would be uh, an income over here an equal income 580. This wouldn't be an equilibrium. But what makes it an equilibrium is that there's 20 billion of net investment. So between 580 of consumption and 20 of net investment, now we have a 600 billion income equilibrium. Okay, but without overdoing this, uh, out of this 600 billion equilibrium income, how much appears to be paid by consumption and how much by investment? 580. It appears consumption is paying 580 and investment 20. That's how the Keynesians see it. They see uh, consumption as uh, paying the overwhelming bulk of the incomes in the economy. And that's what's indicated uh, by any such diagram as this. They think uh, consumption is the really big gun uh, and investment uh, accounts for the remaining smidgen. It has a, an alleged multiplier effect but uh, the overwhelming bulk of incomes is supposedly paid by consumption. Mm. There, there, comes, there comes the reasoning process. When was that Keynesian era? When was Keynes? When was the era? Well, Keynes himself died in 1946, and his uh, major book was published in 1936 or 37. But uh, his influence continues very powerfully down to the present day. Uh, what, was his, what was his major uh, publication? Uh, his major book is called The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. And uh, a major disciple of his is uh, Paul Samuelson, who's now very old, uh, but uh, his uh, textbook, I think, is in its 18th edition or something. Uh, for many decades, it was uh, the leading textbook of the country. Uh, we have now uh, a number of other uh, prominent textbooks. But uh, pretty much all of them have the same uh, basic uh, contents. And uh, I think you'll find a Keynesian cross in just about every textbook, uh, 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 an assumption that national income is paid by the sum of consumption plus investment, and consumption is uh, the, far and away uh, the major item. Yes, uh, Mr. Davis. Um, are we should we expect to be tested on that particular <laughs> component? Well, let's, let's get to it. We'll, we'll see it in a little more detail, and we'll, we can answer the question better. Yeah. I'm going to give, I'm going to, there will be, I'm going to give you a question here, uh, something very similar to which will appear on the final, and you'll be asked to identify uh, how much of income is paid by consumption, how much is paid by productive expenditure, but we have to develop the framework a little more. Yeah, we might want to develop that a Okay. Now, uh, what I want to uh, do is uh, present what I think is an accurate uh, conception, uh, one which recognizes the role of productive expenditure. What I'm going to attempt to show is that while it is true, uh, it is true that uh, national income does equal consumption plus net investment, and consumption is in fact vastly larger than net investment. Uh, we could even have conditions in which net investment showed up as zero. That would be possible. Uh, I'm still going to show that the great bulk of spending in the economic system uh, is productive expenditure, and uh, the productive expenditure is concealed under the head of net investment. I'm going to try uh, to show that net investment in its relationship to total spending in the economy is like the visible portion of an iceberg is to its overall volume. You know, uh, the visible part of an iceberg in the ocean, uh, I think, is on the order of one-tenth of the volume of the iceberg. Most of it is underwater. 
Well, uh, similarly, uh, most of the spending that goes on under the head of net investment is also underwater in the <coughs> following sense. Uh, one of the things I will show is that net investment is the difference between two huge magnitudes. One is total productive expenditure in the economy, uh, where most of the spending uh, is counted, and the other part is the total costs that are deducted from sales revenues in calculating profits. Uh, I'll be out to show uh, along the way that net investment is equal to productive expenditure minus costs. And you could conceivably have productive expenditure and costs equal. They'll never be hugely different. And if they were equal, net investment would be zero, but still the great bulk of spending in the economy would be under the head of net investment. Now, what I want to do is go into a step-by-step -step derivation of the equality between profits and wages on the one side and consumption plus net investment on the other and show how it conforms to this, how it illustrates this. Now, incidentally, along the way, <coughs> uh, to reduce the number of terms we're working with, uh, I've compressed the four components, profit, wages, interest, and rent, into just two profits and wages. Let me justify that for a moment. Uh, we can uh, uh, put interest together with profits. Uh, all we have to do essentially is uh, take profit as pre-deduction of interest cost. We'll take profit as gross of interest. Uh, the same thing you would do if you were calculating uh, the magnitude of return earned in a firm. If you wanted to calculate the rate of return on capital, you'd have to add the profits and interest together. Well, we'll do that, and we'll just uh, work with a profit concept that's gross of the interest. Now then, there's this remaining item, rent. Uh, for the most part, rent is a fiction as it's portrayed in the accounts. I think I pointed out last week uh, that uh, the biggest part of the uh, component, net rental uh, income of persons, is an imputation. It's an allowance for an alleged net rental value of owner-occupied housing, where there is no rental. You're in the house, you're in your own house, they're not paying rent, they're not getting rent, but they go into the complicated procedure uh, to try to create this imputation for rent. I think we discussed this adequately last week. So to that extent, the whole component is a fiction. That there is some legitimate part of net rental income. Uh, there are uh, uh, certain net rental incomes. But uh, to the extent that there are, we'll add them to profits too. If, if you're truly making an income on a rental, well, how does that differ from a profit? So we'll count that with profit. So we have uh, just two uh, basic components profits plus wages, that's national income, and we're going to show step by step how this uh, equals uh, consumption plus net investment. Now, uh, we do this in a series of uh, simple equations. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl, are you able to see this? Okay, we start off with equation one. By definition, the sum of profits and wages equals national income. No, I don't think anyone will have a quarrel with that. That's just true by definition. In equation two, instead of uh, continuing with profits, we substitute for profits sales minus costs. Does anyone have a problem with that? I mean, what is a profit in the case of any individual firm? It's the sales minus costs. Well, uh, we're talking about total aggregate profit in the whole economy, so if we want to express it in terms of sales minus cost, uh, we need to add up all the sales revenues of all the firms in the whole economy and subtract the totality of all the income statement costs. That will be aggregate profit. Now, I use the letter D uh, instead of C because C is associated with consumption, so we're using D for deduction. Uh, S minus D is profit. Now, in equation three, all we do is substitute equation two into equation one. We have national income is now equal to sales minus cost plus wages. Aggregate sales minus aggregate cost plus wages. That's so would national. wages go under cost? Well, now wages uh, are a component of cost, but uh, there are timing differences. And uh, we're still we're looking at wages in a double perspective. So the income runners and expense. Uh, 
it's one a wage earner's income is the wages he's paid, right? Now there's certainly a connection between the wages paid and the cost deducted, right? And even if the wages paid were deducted simultaneously, uh, if we're looking at total incomes, profits and wages together, we'd have to look at sales minus cost for profits and add wages to get profits and wages together. So they've already been deducted. Well, uh, you deduct wages from sales to get profits, but uh, you have to add wages to get the sum of profits and wages. Uh, to this extent, uh, wages enter positively and negatively. But in reality, the wages that are paid and the uh, appearance of wages as cost, uh, they're related, but they are typically not identical. Because just think, uh, suppose you're paying wages to workers uh, to construct a building. Okay, and those workers are getting their wages now, right? When will their wages show up as a cost? When they're paid. Well, when will it show up as a deduction from sales revenues in an income statement? Later. Pardon me? Later. Later. Well, no. Uh, uh, pardon me? In the period the revenue is recognized. And when will the revenue be recognized? You're having a building constructed. Right, you get paid. Uh, how many years does the building stay in service? And over how many years will revenue be associated with the cost of the building? Over the depreciable life of the building. So let's say, here we are, we paid a million dollars in wages as part of the cost of constructing a building. And this building will last 40 years. Uh, how will we depreciate the building? Well, presumably 2.5% a year. So uh, it'll be 25,000 a year for 40 years. That's when the wages are showing up as part of the cost. So uh, the wages in this case are showing up as a cost over the next 40 years. Now, it's not uh, often that extreme, but uh, suppose uh, we're looking at a manufacturing concern. Uh, General Motors is paying wages in October, November, and December. And uh, much of these wages are being paid uh, to produce cars, which General Motors and its dealers may not sell until January and February. Uh, and when will the wages being paid in October, November, and December show up as part of General Motors' cost of goods sold? Well, when those cars are sold, not when they're produced, when they're sold. So uh, there are important timing differences. Now, there are some wages which are uh, deducted as costs immediately. Uh, uh, that might be uh, uh, some uh, the wages perhaps of executives, I don't know, depending on uh, the accounting treatment. Uh, there's selling general and administrative expenses. And I think the usual procedure is uh, not to capitalize these outlays, but to deduct them immediately as a cost. Well, to that extent, you'd have uh, wages uh, showing up both as a cost right away and as being added to the sales revenues. Maybe we should call that a labor, labor rather than wages. So well, the monetary amount, the monetary amount is wages. You see, the labor would mean the number of hours of work of a given kind but we have to uh, bring in the monetary totals. So here we are, we start off, national income is profit plus wages. No, is there a problem with that? No. Okay, is there a problem with profits or sales minus costs? <coughs> is there a problem that profits plus wages equal sales minus costs plus wages? No. Uh, we've got it simply by substitution. Now, uh, what I want to do as the next step is we want to look at the sales revenues, and we want to look at the sales revenues from the perspective of the customers and from the perspective of their purpose in, in making their purchases. And from that point of view, we can take every dollar of sales revenue and regard it uh, from the point of view of the buyer as either a productive expenditure or a consumption expenditure. Let's uh, deal with the sales revenues of General Motors and its dealers. Uh, to the extent that people are buying General Motors cars for the purpose of their own personal transportation, not for business purposes, uh, what kind of expenditure is that? Consumption. A consumption expenditure. Now, uh, we would categorize that uh, as S sub C. Now, the S is for sales revenue. The sub C is uh, that when you view it from the perspective of the customer, it's a consumption expenditure. So S sub C is that part of business sales revenues 
which are coming from consumption expenditures. The S sub B is that part of business sales revenues, which from the point of view of the customer is a productive expenditure. So let's say uh, national car rental uh, buys uh, thousands of cars from General Motors. Why are they buying General Motors cars? Business. For business purposes. So what kind of expenditure is that? Productive. It's a productive expenditure. Uh, there are also uh, corporations uh, buying General Motors cars for business purposes. That's productive expenditure. Uh, General Motors has a uh, heavy truck division, I believe. Uh, uh, that would almost entirely be uh, productive expenditures. Uh, its diesel locomotive division uh, w would be largely uh, productive expenditures to the extent that freight railroads are, are buying them. Uh, it, it, looking at things from the point of view of the customers, every dollar of sales revenue is either a productive expenditure or a consumption expenditure. Uh, all of those sales revenues that are consumption expenditures from the perspective of the customers we uh, call S sub C. All of those which from the perspective of the customers are productive expenditures we call S sub B. Is there any dollar of sales revenues that won't fit into one or the other category? No, no I wouldn't think so. And we do exactly the same thing with wages. This is from the perspective of the employer. Uh, all of the wages paid by business firms are wage payments that from the point of view of the employer are productive expenditures. So we call them W sub B. Uh, there are other uh, wages that are paid, uh, the most important being the government's payroll, and then there are some maids employed by housewives and so forth, uh, uh, butlers and uh, secretaries employed by very wealthy people. Uh, this would be uh, wages that from the point of view of the employer is consumption expenditure, mm -hmm. W sub C. Now, I've used the subscript B uh, because P is taken up by profit. So think of B as business. B is business. That's productive expenditure. <clears throat> now, uh, I call these uh, SB, SC, WB, WC, I call them revenue hyphen expenditure subcomponents. Their revenue when looked at from the point of view of the seller. Their expenditure when looked at from the point of view of the buyer. Now, all that we do in equation six, in equation six, all we've done is substitute four and five into three. Here's three, uh, S minus D plus W, that's national income. We've broken S and W down into these two revenue expenditure subcomponents. And in equation six, we uh, substitute them. And so now we have uh, that part of sales revenues, which is consumption expenditure, plus that part of sales revenues, which is productive expenditure, minus costs, plus that part of wages, which is consumption expenditure, plus that part of wages, which is productive expenditure. Uh, all of this taken together, what's it equal? It's still national income. We just have an elaboration. Now the next step is uh, that uh, what we want to do is uh, change the order of addition of these components. Uh, up to now, we've been adding them in order of their revenue type. We've had uh, S sub C and SB minus D. We've had WC and WB. We're looking at things from the perspective of profits and wages. Now we want to change the order of addition uh, to accord with the kind of expenditures that are present. So we're going to group the S sub C and the W sub C together, one after the other, and the SB and the WB together, one after the other, and move uh, costs to the end. <coughs> is there any problem with doing this? No. Well, all we have to do next is realize that the two uh, sub C components add up to total consumption. The two sub B components add up to total productive expenditure. And now what we have, uh, when we substitute uh, eight and nine into seven, we have C plus B minus D is equal to Y. A consumption expenditure plus productive expenditure minus cost, that's equal to national income. And then the last thing to realize, which I'll have to wait to demonstrate next week, is that productive expenditure minus cost is net investment. We'll, we'll repeat that last one. The productive expenditure, B representing total productive expenditure, minus cost, that's Bye. net investment. But, Yes, that's I. Oh. Here it is. B minus D is I. And then, if that's true, all we do is we substitute I for B minus D, and we have C plus I is Y. We've derived it. It's true. But, pardon me? 
rudimentary. I'm sorry? <laughs> rudimentary. But if you grasp it, it is rudimentary. It's not that difficult. But uh, having looked at it this way, we're in a position to see that most of the actual spending in the economy is under the heading of I. It's I is B minus D. B is huge. That's where most of the spending is. Oh, really? Net investment? It's productive expenditure is most of the spending. Net investment is productive expenditure minus cost. That's to be demonstrated first thing next week. So back to spending.